First, let me just introduce the panel. So my name is Dr. Jennifer Rohn. I'm a teaching fellow on the Applied Medical Sciences course. I'm the deputy course director and the admissions tutor. So if you do apply to, to our course, you'd be talking to me. And I also am a scientist at UCL and do lots of interesting research. And uh, uh, my colleague, uh, jo will introduce herself. I'm Dr. Jo Seal. I'm a medic and a researcher by background, and I teach on the ANS program and some other programs at UCL. So, welcome. And finally, Neff. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Naftali Marina Gonzalez. I'm an associate professor in the Division of Medicine. Um, I'm a medic and I'm a cardiovascular neuroscientist. I work in the Center for Cardiovascular. Uh, and metabolic neuroscience here in UCL. Welcome everyone. And we're just gonna start with a quick, just a quick presentation. Hello and welcome to our taster day today. We're really excited to be here. Uh, we have um, basically a really jam packed fun program and we're just gonna start with just five slides explaining a little bit more about the course uh, and then we'll dive right into the science. So this is Applied Medical Sciences at University College London. It's a three year BSc program which uh, fuses science uh, with medicine. That's our motto. And so we develop science graduates with a strong medical background. So this is a little bit different from a biomedical sciences course. It's, it's more medically focused. This will give you a strategic advantage when you're applying for jobs that require deep insights into your clinical medicine. And we have a personalized and tailored degree and you can choose from a wide variety of modules to, to develop a degree that really suits your needs. And we really do believe that you can find your dream job by following along our course. Now, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I just wanted to give you a rough overview of what the course is like. Um, you start out in year one, sharing everything with five other co related courses in the Faculty of Medical Sciences. It's really nice. So you're in a big group cohort with a bunch of other people. These are the other courses listed up here. You're an applied medical sciences student, but you're sharing the first year which is basically a whistle, top, whistle stop tour of the human body. You learn all the organs and how they work and the science behind that. And it gives you a really good foundation. And then in year twos and three, year two and three, uh, these six groups break up into their individual degrees. Um, however, AMS is the broad choice, but there are other more specialized courses. It's quite flexible. If after the first year of AMS, you decide you're more interested in say cancer or sports or infection, you can actually switch to one of the other degrees, but you don't have to. You can stick with AMS and have that more uh, broad view. And it's a really, really nice, flexible way of doing things. Okay. Um, it, it, it's so hard to talk about AMS. I've only got a few minutes. I'm just gonna focus on a very few things. We're innovative. Uh, we have diverse teaching styles and, and we have world leading scientists, clinicians doing the teaching. And interestingly, we've been specializing in the online classroom since 2014. So way before COVID, we were doing lots of innovative online uh, learning, but we also have a serious face-to-face -face component, which unfortunately at the moment we can't do. But once the pandemic is over, you will enjoy the benefits of both online and face-to-face -face learning. We give really enhanced employability skills for that all-important post-COVID market. It's going to be very difficult for graduates, uh, but regardless of what, what you decide you want to do, we can help you um, develop those very important skills. We have two interesting things in year three, the, the research project, which is a really intensive module where you do real-time research. And we also have an optional professional placement module, which, are, which is really fun. You go off and do work for somebody else uh, for credit. And a, a number of our graduates have gotten job offers from these placements. So it's a really nice way to find out whether that, that your chosen dream job actually is what you want to do. And finally, UCL is just the most stimulating environment. It's a world leading university. We've, we've won 29 Nobel prizes and 16 of those were in physiology or medicine, which is sort of related to our course. So it's a really uh, inspiring place to do your degree. And just the last slide here, everybody always wants to know what our graduates end up doing. We follow them very carefully. Um, so First, uh, the most common thing that our graduates do is they go on to further study. A lot of our students go on to do medicine and become doctors. A lot of our students go on to do PhDs or a master's uh, degrees to, to, to develop their skills further. We've even had a few go into dentistry. And then other students go straight into employment. They don't bother with further education. We've had people going into clinical trials management, consultancies, public health, working for the government, finance and, and analysts and science communication and writing. So uh, basically, 
this is a really good course if you want to learn about science, you want to learn about medicine, you want to learn how they fit together. And um, there's plenty of time at the end for you to ask all the questions you want to ask about AMS. So I think I'm going to leave it at that for now. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Seal, who is going to start you off on our exciting scientific journey. All right, so today we are going to explore the cardiorespiratory system using a case-based approach, where we will look at a scenario involving an individual who ends up suffering from a currently rather common infection. But you can't guess what that is. But before we do, we need to make sure everyone has the same background understanding. So let's start by having a look at something we all have, and that is the circulatory system. So, here is a pictorial representation of what we're going to be focusing on today, although in particular, we'll be looking at the upper part of the image, which reflects your cardiorespiratory system. And just to orientate you, the left side of the screen refers to the right side of the body, whereas the right side of the screen refers to the left side of the body. Now, as I'm sure you already know, the circulatory system consists of your two lungs and your one heart. And that's of course, you're the rather popular sci-fi character, Doctor Who, who apparently has two, anyway, we are mere humans, so have one heart, which pumps the blood from the right side of the heart to the lungs so that pulmonary gas exchange could occur in which oxygen is taken up into the blood and carbon dioxide is released into the lungs. Then having gone around the left side of the heart, the blood travels via the arteries to the various tissues in our body in order to release the oxygen and pick up carbon dioxide. The now deoxygenated blood travels in our veins back to the right side of the heart in order to once again travel to the lungs. So let's follow the lead of Sherlock Holmes or any other detective and investigate further the action of the lungs. So the lungs are located anatomically in the thoracic cavity, also called the chest cavity, which you can see here. And the thoracic cavity itself contains the lungs, the tracheobronchial tree, the heart and associated vessels. So there's quite a bit to pack in there. As such, the thoracic cavity is the second largest hollow space of the body. So now if you ever find yourself on university challenge and are asked, what is the name of the second largest hollow space in the body? You know the answer. Just remember when you win, I told you the answer, okay? Just very important. By the way, the abdominal pelvic cavity is considered to be the largest cavity in the body. So here we have your lungs sitting in your thoracic cavity. Well, not literally your lungs, of course, as that would require us to perform some rather invasive surgery. However, this is a representation of your lungs and its various features. So we can see the upper airway starting at the trachea, which branches into the left and right bronchi, and these lead onto the two lungs. Now, an interesting point for any of you medically inclined out there is that the right main bronchus is wider, shorter, and more vertical than the left main bronchus. And due to this, objects that are accidentally inhaled are more likely to enter in the right lung than the left. And just to prove it, here's an example of a foreign body in the right main bronchus. Now this is an x-ray of a young child and further history revealed that the child's parents had recently been assembling some new furniture at home. I think a little bit may be missing. And again, whenever I make furniture, I'm always missing bits. Although maybe next time I should check that my young nephew hasn't inhaled them. Right. Back to our lungs. As in each lung, the bronchi themselves branch many times into smaller airways, ending in the narrowest airways, the bronchiole, which are as small as one half of a millimeter across. And at the end of the bronchiole, we have lots of alveoli. So if we look a bit closer, the alveoli form clusters that are said to resemble bunches of grapes. Personally, I think they look more like cauliflower, but let's just say they look like a health food of some sort. Now, in terms of cellular structure, the wall of each alveolus, which as I'm sure you're aware is the singular form of an alveoli, is lined by extremely thin flat cells called type one pneumocytes, which are involved in the process of that all important gas exchange. There are also type two pneumocytes, which secrete a film of fatty substances called surfactant, and that's believed to contribute to lowering alveolar surface tension. Now, without this coating, the alveoli would collapse and a very large force would be needed in order to re-expand them. So here we have a histological slice of the alveoli, which mainly has lots of space shown by the white, well, it looks a bit blue on the screen, bluey white areas. And that's for that lovely air, as there's lots of air in our lungs, which is rather obvious as they're a respiratory organ. Now, this slice also shows us how thin the blood gas barrier is. 
by which I mean the barrier between the air in the alveoli and the blood in the capillaries of the lung. And it's understandable that the barrier is so thin, as it's only composed of endothelial cells, a thin interstitial space, and those type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes. And this thinness makes sense because oxygen and carbon dioxide cross this alveolar capillary membrane by passive diffusion. So you don't really want a thick barrier. The thicker the barrier, the greater the resistance to diffusion. So in general, during gas exchange, oxygen will diffuse across the membrane from the alveoli into the blood. And this is because the partial pressure of oxygen is higher in the alveoli than in the capillaries. By the way, in case you need a reminder, the partial pressure of something relates to, well, when you have a mixture of gases, such as in the case of air, then each individual gas will have a particular pressure in that gas mixture. And that is what we're referring to when we talk about the partial pressure of a particular gas. So here in this case, we have the uh, partial pressure of the oxygen being higher in the alveoli than in the blood. And that leads to this kind of diffusion across the membrane. Conversely, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the capillaries is much higher than that in the alveoli, which means that net diffusion occurs into the alveoli from the capillaries. In addition, the carbon dioxide in the alveoli is higher in terms of pressure than the external environment. And so we subsequently exhale our carbon dioxide. Now, despite its thinness, the blood gas barrier has to be immensely strong because the exchange of these gases create pressure on the membrane, which could damage it. However, due to its strength, under normal pressures, there's no problem. But in the presence of lung or heart diseases, you can get an increase in alveolar and or capillary pressure, which can lead to a breakdown of that barrier. And as I'm sure you can appreciate, this is not going to be good for our gas exchange capabilities. So just to bring all that information together, let's have a look at the lung overall. So here we have a resin cast of the lungs, in which on the right of the image, you can see the vasculature that we've been talking about. And then on the left, you see a branching of all those lovely airways. Just as an aside for any of you who are interested in trees, you might like to know that our lungs have a lot in common with trees as their branching nature shows a similar pattern to those of a tree. And just like a tree, the branches of our lungs allow for an increased surface area. In fact, if you take an average pair of adult lungs and spread out then the surface area is about the same area as that of a tennis court. Though I don't think it would be very useful for a tennis game. You'd be slipping all over the place with that surfactant, wouldn't you really? However, if you need any more evidence that we essentially have a mini tree in our chest, then just look at the lungs upside down. And you can see that it shows what's called a fractural pattern, much like a tree, in which larger branches branch into increasingly smaller ones, which I guess explains why we often talk of the bronchial tree. Right, so what have we established so far? Well, the heart and lungs work together to deliver oxygenated blood to our tissues. The respiratory system consists of numerous branches culminating in alveoli in which gas exchange occurs, and you have a tree-like structure in your thoracic cavity. Hey, but you didn't know that one. Okay, so I think we have enough background knowledge now in order to meet the star of our case study. So here we have Mr. P. N. Demick who is a 50 year old gentleman and happens to be a politician. Uh, he's a little bit overweight with a body mass index of 28, um, but he doesn't really have much in his past medical history, appendicitis um, when he was nine, but nothing really since then. What we first need to do is go back in time. Not literally, of course, because we have no time machine, but let's go back anyway, if we dare to 2020, and it's the 20th of February. And it happens to be Mr. Pandemic's 50th birthday. And as such, it's party time. Now, Mr. P. Endemic has a lot of contacts. I'd say friends, but he's a politician, so I'm not sure about that one. But anyway, he knows a lot of people. So he has a massive party with people from all over the country and globe coming to join in. It's a great night and he has a fabulous time. But 10 days later, he is not feeling very well as he's experiencing shortness of breath, a persistent cough. He's also got anosmia, which is loss of smell, and he's running a bit of a temperature, 38 or above. And over the next few days, he progressively worsens, especially his shortness of breath, and is subsequently taken to hospital for treatment. Now, upon admission, Mr. P. N. Demick undergoes a number of investigations, one of which is a swab of his throat. 
and also of his nose. And this is in order to check for a virus which has started to be detected in an increasing number of people worldwide. So if we fast forward to later in the day and the swab results are back, and what do you know, they are, I'm doing a dramatic pause for effect here. Okay, that's enough of a dramatic pause, positive for COVID-19. Now, Mr. P endemic has been very busy lately. And as such, although he's heard about a new virus, he doesn't really know much about it. So he asks his personal assistant to find someone who can tell him more about the coronavirus and is subsequently put into contact with a well-known scientist and lecturer at UCL, Dr. Rowan, who kindly obliges to outline the emergence of this virus and its characteristics. So let's see what Dr. Rowan can tell Mr. P endemic and us about COVID-19. Thanks, Joe. So I think everybody knows a little bit about viruses, but I thought just to be clear, we would just go over the basics to make sure we're all on the same page. So viruses are really amazing things. They are so simple. And on this diagram, I don't know if you can see my cursor, they have very, very few parts. So all viruses have a genome, which is made of DNA or RNA, and they're all surrounded by a capsid, which is a protective coat. So all viruses have both of those things. Some viruses have additional things. Some viruses have accessory enzymes that they carry along with them to help with the replication process. And other viruses actually steal the outer envelope from our own cells as they're jetting out. So, and then there's proteins embedded in that. So most viruses have the structure, uh, the, the basic structure, some have the add-ons. And then if you look uh, throughout the, the kingdom of viruses, there's all sorts of weird and wonderful shapes. So not all round like this. So you got things like Ebola virus, which is a crazy looking thing. And these sort of bacteriophages, which are frankly look like alien invaders. Uh, and there's all everything in between. So viruses are very varied and they're uh, very, very minimal. I think it's important to point out that, that they're, they're actually not alive. Um, they're like little robots. They're just dependent on the host completely for their survival. And the only thing they really wanna do is get to the next host. They don't care if, if they kill you in the process. Okay, so how do viruses replicate? Uh, essentially, they have to get in, first they have to get into the body. So you inhale them or you touch them or you, you otherwise uh, take on the virus. The virus has a really uh, tough time getting through the immune system, but eventually some of them may manage to dock onto the cells. And in the case of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, it docks here through the ACE2 receptor. The virus actually goes inside our cells. It dives in and uncoats, unzips, and begins this amazing process of taking over our cells. Uh, it, it's like a factory for making more viruses and they trick us into making all the parts that they need to make new viruses, which then leave the cell. Some viruses explode the cell on their way out. Other viruses like SARS-CoV-2 just butt out and grab the envelope on their way out. So they hijack our cells and force them to make copies, which is pretty amazing. That's not enough though. You can make lots and lots of viruses, but if you can't escape the host and get onto the next host, you're dead in the water. So the next thing they have to do is, is get out of the body and find a new victim. Okay, next slide, please. So I want to talk just a few words about animal virus uh, infections. So viruses that come from animals, this is called zoonoses. It's a, it's a fancy word that means the spillover of animal viruses into humans. These are particularly dangerous. If you could just advance all the animation, that would be great. Um, there's three examples here that will give you a flavor. So Ebola virus is a virus that occasionally spills over from monkeys into humans. And as you probably know, it's, it's devastating. It doesn't spread very well because it's so deadly. And it tends to happen in the jungle where there aren't a lot of people. Uh, that doesn't mean that if Ebola didn't land in the middle of Heathrow Airport, that it wouldn't cause a lot of problems. But uh, it's, it's quite, uh, it burns hot, it burns fast, and it burns out. So that's one example. Then we have HIV, which is a really interesting case of an animal virus that's adapted to humans and become a human virus. So sometime in the middle of the last century, uh, through interactions with monkeys that were infected with simian immunodeficiency virus, the first human being caught this, this virus and eventually it, it spread throughout humans and it adapted to us. And now it's a bona fide human virus, HIV. Finally, avian influenza, this is a really scary one. This is an example of a virus that isn't that successful. So birds get it, it's a flu and humans can catch it from birds. But fortunately for us, even though it's a really nasty disease, it doesn't spread very well. It's not adapted to humans. It's, it's not very good at humans. So it jumps onto a human, makes them really, really, really sick. But, but 
cannot then pass to the next host. And that's a crucial thing to keep in mind. So you here have examples. You have a virus that's too deadly and doesn't spread well. You've got a virus HIV that's very well adapted to spreading and is doing really well in the human population. And then you have an example of bird flu, which is a really kind of a rubbish virus that's not very good at humans. And, and you can get everything in between when it comes to zoonoses. Okay, next slide, please. Um, go ahead and advance all the animation. Thank you. So there are Coronaviruses are really interesting. And in fact, they used to be considered to be quite boring. They were discovered in the last century. Um, they cause the common cold. They infect us every year. There's four different kinds that do this. We all get colds every year and we, we don't think too much about it. And, and coronaviruses are, you know, it used to be very boring. But in the in recent past, they've become more, more interesting to us. And that's because they've caused pandemics or, or, or outbreaks. So on the left hand side, you hear you see SARS, SARS class. This is a virus that arose in 2003 and vanished without a trace a year later because of public health measures. It was very deadly, uh, but not very contagious. And it's thought that this came from bats and went through an intermediate of an animal. They're not really sure what animal. We're still fighting over that, but it's probably a civet or something like that. And that jumped onto humans. And that's a zoonosis. It's dangerous. There's another one, another coronavirus called MERS which had a, a bat origin a, and a camel intermediate. And it's still around today. It's also very deadly, but it's very, very rare. So those are two notorious coronaviruses from the past. Next slide, please. Um, and I think you all know about SARS-CoV-2, which is another zoonosis from a bat coronavirus, probably. <laughs> we don't really know for sure, but people are pretty sure it's a bat virus. There may be no animal intermediate. Uh, some people have theorized that this virus actually arose earlier in 2019. Some people think it even arose in Italy. There's all sorts of theories. If you look at the sequences of the viruses out there, we're not really sure what happened, but there is no question that this virus, there was a super spreader event in Wuhan in China uh, at the end of December. And that's when this whole thing kicked off. Um, and I think every time I give this talk, the numbers of deaths and the numbers of infections have risen. This was the case a few days ago. 1.8 million deaths worldwide, 85 million cases. So this is a very successful virus. It's highly contagious and it doesn't kill so quickly that it's not a successful virus. It's a very well adapted virus. It jumps right onto humans and it's, it's just away. It, it's, it was a really um, bad luck basically. And that's basically everything you need to know about coronavirus. So we can go back to the physiology. Hey, thank you very much. So now that we are all informed, and so is Mr. P. Endemic, let us get back to our story. So now we know the characteristics of the virus, we can use this to explain Mr. P. Endemic symptoms. So the first ones we have are the respiratory related ones, so that shortness of breath and the cough. Now, these symptoms are not surprising given that SARS CoV 2 is a respiratory virus, but how does it both enter and damage the lungs? Well, We've already alluded to that um, through the talk a moment ago, but to understand it a bit more, we need to get to know that enzyme, the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which thankfully is shortened to ACE2. Now, this membrane bound enzyme is a very important enzyme as it plays a role in the cardiovascular and immune systems, among other things. As such, it's expressed in various places in the body, such as the heart, the kidneys, and the lungs specifically the alveolar cells in the case of the lungs. ACE2 has also been identified in the nose, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, that's all fascinating stuff, but what is its actual real relevance with regards to coronavirus or COVID-19 in this case? Well, it's because ACE2 is relevant because it's been identified as a functional receptor for coronaviruses, including the ones responsible for the, the one rather, responsible for the present pandemic. Specifically, what happens, as alluded to by Jenny earlier, and if this animation works, aha, um, is that the viral membrane protein binds to the ACE2 on the surface of the host cell then fuses with the membrane, allowing it to enter the cell along with the ACE2 protein. And as a result, the ACE2 protein is degraded within the cell. Now, as you can probably guess, ACE2 is expressed in the nose as well as the lungs. And so we have two main areas where the viral particles in the air can invade. As I mentioned a moment ago, well, have a look at the nose in a moment. But first we need to look at the lung side, given that we're trying to explain the respiratory symptoms Mr. P endemic is having. 
So as I mentioned before, ACE2 is expressed by the alveoli, which allows the virus to enter the cells. And it is this invasion that leads to the respiratory symptoms because ACE2 normally has a lung protective effect. But as we can see, the coronavirus disrupts the ACE2 and therefore its lung protection pathway. As well as this, the virus once in the lungs will invade healthy cells. And as Dr. Rohn told us, it will hijack them internal machinery in order to replicate. And when the virus is done, it'll kill, and, it kill the cells and spread around. So in addition to all of this, the presence of the virus will cause the immune system to respond, which is a good thing as we want our immune system to respond, but our immune system can overreact and itself cause damage to lung tissue while just trying to kill the virus. And with all this going on, we get those respiratory symptoms of our patient. So what about the anosmia? Well, a reduction or loss of smell often occurs when we have an upper respiratory infection, such as a cold. I'm sure we all know that feeling of being bunged up, unable to smell anything properly, or even appreciate food as a large proportion of the flavor of food is actually due to the smell, not the taste receptors on our tongue. Now, in these instances, the sense of smell is often lost due to the nasal congestion we get in the presence of a cold. However, COVID-19 patients typically don't have that stuffy nose. So how is COVID causing anosmia in these patients? Well, although this research is still in its early stages, neuroscientists at Harvard Medical School have discovered that infection by SARS-CoV-2 affects non-neural supporting cells found in the olfactory epithelium. The olfactory epithelium is a specialized tissue in the roof of the nasal cavity that houses the olfactory sensory neurons and a variety of supporting cells. So SARS-CoV-2 is not directly affecting the cells that detect and transmit the sense of smells to, smell to the brain, but instead it appears to be affecting the supporting cells that provide metabolic and structural support to those olfactory sensory neurons. Now, you may wonder why the target, the virus targets the supporting cells. Well, it relates back again to the ACE2, which as we've seen, acts as a receptor protein. And research has shown that the sensory olfactory cells do not express the ACE2 protein gene, whereas the supporting cells do. And as such, the coronavirus alters the function of these cells. And it is this alteration that is proposed to result in the anosmia. However, as I mentioned at the beginning, this research is still in its early stages. So hopefully more details will come about as it progresses. Now, as you will have heard, respiratory symptoms and anosmia are not the only symptoms associated with the coronavirus. In fact, there are many, including fever and tiredness and, and the list shown in front of you. In addition, the progression of the viral infection can result in further complications, especially those related to the respiratory tract, such as pneumonia. Now, pneumonia is an infection that affects one or both lungs. It causes the alveolar of the lungs to fill up, typically with pus, sometimes just, just fluid, and it's bacterial, viruses, fungi, any of those can cause pneumonia, and coronavirus is no exception. So in COVID-19 pneumonia, you get lung consolidation, which refers to that filling up of the air spaces with pus, which essentially consists of dead cells and debris, and you also get alveoli collapse. As a result, breathing becomes difficult and the surface area in the lung where oxygen transfer usually takes place becomes reduced, so you get that breathlessness. Another even more severe complication is called acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is shortened to ARDS. Now, ARDS, or ARDS is another way of saying it, happens when the lungs become severely inflamed from an infection and so it can occur in severe cases of COVID-19. And it's characterized by inflammation, increased pulmonary vascular permeability, and a loss of aerated lung tissue. And part of this is due to that persistent injury caused by inflammatory cells and viral replication, which lead to a loss of those pneumocytes. You also get activation of coagulation, and inhibition of fibrinolysis. And subsequently, you'll get the formation of blood clots in the vessels of the lung, which again, impacts on gas exchange. However, it should be noted that although RDS is a severe complication of COVID, it will not occur in all those admitted to hospital. So now we've talked a bit about the potential progression of severe cases of COVID, let's get back to Mr. P. Endemic. 
and unfortunately he's currently not doing very well as his respiratory function has deteriorated and he's now been transferred to ITU in order to have more intensive treatment investigations. And one of these investigations is a CT, as it's important to look at his lungs. But before we do that, we'd better have a brief overview of computerized tomography or CT scans, which are also called CAT scans, but they've got nothing to do with putting a cat in a scanner. However, you can put a cat in a scanner and here's the proof although I really wouldn't want to be there when he wakes up. Anyway, back to humans. So CT scans are a non-invasive computer assisted x-ray procedure. And in the CT scan, the individual typically will lie on their back on a flat bed that passes into the CT scanner. And the scanner itself consists of kind of donut type ring, which you can see there, but it's not edible. Um, there's, there's an x-ray source inside it that rotates around the body area of interest as the person passes through it. And this is what creates the images as the rotating x-ray beam produces horizontal, otherwise known as axial images, sometimes they're called slices, and the computer kind of stitches them together to get a full image. CT scanners are more detailed than standard x-rays, but they do require a much higher dose of radiation. So now we know all about CTs, it's time to see what could be happening with Mr. P. Endemic's lungs. And luckily, we have Dr. Marina Gonzalez around, who is a cardiovascular neuroscientist. And as we heard earlier, he's also an associate professor at UCL, and as such can tell us about the potential changes we could see in our patient's lung. I'm just going to stop my screen sharing here and hand over. Now's the time to look at the imaging. First, we need to look at normal imaging. Um, most of the patients actually, when they get admitted, uh, one of the first approaches is to, to take an X-ray or a CT scan of the chest. So uh, most of the patients are going to find um, you're going to see that everything seems to be normal. So we're going to be using this little application. It's uh, some kind of simulator of what we call a, a picture archive computerized system. This is the kind of imaging you're going to see in a radiology department. And this is an application that was created in Denmark and it's freely uh, available, it's open access, and you can actually uh, see it and, and play with it. So if you have managed to open this application, you're gonna see four images here, okay? So what I suggest you do uh, in order to follow me, uh, just put your uh, screen, uh, just divide your screen in half, okay? Something like that. And in the other half, you can open your Zoom uh, window. So that way you can basically see what I'm doing in the, in the Zoom window, and then you can interact with the simulator on, on, uh, on, the, on your own computer, okay? So I'm gonna keep my, my screen uh, just showing the simulator so, so you can see it as big as possible. But please follow, try to follow me, and, and even after this session, try to play with this, uh, with this simulator. It's a really interesting way to teach anatomy. Actually, I use all of the simulators we're gonna use today. Uh, I use them to teach my modules of uh, functional anatomy and medical imaging in, 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 in the year one courses, for example. And the other one I use for my modules of cardiovascular and respiratory physiology. So, so they, they are very useful and they are very, very, uh, interesting. So what we're going to do, as you can see, in the uh, this is all normal uh, morphology, normal anatomy, okay, in a healthy individual. So let's suppose this is the uh, in the first stages when Mr. Demig was starting to only start getting ill, and he probably went to the hospital and they took the first CT scan. Okay, so we have four uh, projections here because as Dr. Seal was mentioning, the CT scan works in such a way that you, uh, the X-rays are actually traveling around the patient, and then you have a detector around which, which basically absorbs all the X-rays. Uh, we're gonna concentrate on this particular image on the left, which we call here as axial. Axial is basically uh, taking like a slice of the, uh, of the body, like a ham slice, basically, uh, if you can, if you can see, for example, here, this is the body, and we're taking an, a, a slice exactly here, and then basically we're just projecting it and showing it uh, up front. Uh, what you can do with this projection is, uh, I'm gonna leave this one open here. I'm gonna leave this one there. 
and this one here. So if you have a mouse or you can use your arrows or you can use your trackpad, you can just basically scroll up and down. And basically you're gonna see as, as you scroll up and down, you're, you're gonna see this line migrating, which is basically uh, uh, showing you at which level of the body we're imaging at the, uh, at the moment, okay? So as I'm moving down, you start to identify certain structures in, in the body. Here, the, the heart starts to emerge. The heart, obviously, because we're talking about this kind of level, or the level of the mammary glands, probably, that's, that's where the heart starts to emerge. And then you can uh, identify all the structures. If you're really curious, you can actually identify some anatomical landmarks here. Uh, for example, in here we have the mitral valve, the right atrium. And this, is, this really allows our students to identify and to learn anatomy in a way that it was never done before. It's, it's a really interactive and really applicable way of learning anatomy. Instead of just learning from a textbook, we can actually apply all that knowledge and use it here uh, playing with these uh, real images from real patients. Now, the thing I really want to show you is the lungs. The first thing you're gonna see with the lungs is that everything looks black. Now, why does that, why is that? Why, why do lungs look black? Well, we have to basically think about how x-rays work. So x-rays, uh, when, when you have a, 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 an x-ray beam, and then you have, a, for example, on this side, you have the x-ray beam, and on the other side, you have the detector. What the detector is basically detecting is attenuation of x-rays. And this attenuation happens because of the density of the tissues. So for example, you have these tissues which are really white, that's the bone. That's in this case, for example, this is a vertebra and this is the rib. So the bones absorb all the X-rays and uh, so as the rays start passing, they just basically absorb them and attenuate them. And therefore they cannot be detected by, by, by the system. And then this is, uh, this, the computer detects this as a white signal. The air, on the other hand, doesn't attenuate, doesn't absorb the signal. And the, basically the, the X-rays can actually travel freely and can be detected entirely. And then uh, the, uh, the more X-rays are absorbed, the more X-rays are actually detected, the signal becomes darker. In this case, really black because the lungs basically are pretty much air. The lungs are, very, are a very fascinating, uh, fascinating organ very delicate and they're mostly made of air. If you can actually believe me, each one of these lungs can, can hold up to pretty much 1.5 liters of air at any given moment. So it's a lot of air in, in, this, in these organs. That's why in x-rays, the, the lungs always look black, okay? So try to play with the, with the, with the system and try to identify your uh, anatomy. So because in anatomy and in imaging, all the images are kind of like in, in a mirror image, all the images are inverted. So here, what is your left in reality is the right lung here. What I'm, what I'm pointing out at the moment, this is the right lung. And here, this is the left lung, okay? Now, uh, if you can it just basically, uh, we can start from the top. So I'm moving my cursor all the way to the top the top of the lungs that's that will be the top of the lungs very close to the neck and then from here we just basically start scrolling down and we can see that in this patient obviously everything is really normal the, the lungs look very clean uh, all the lung fields look very uh, clean and there's absolutely no signs of pathology everything's really black and everything's really happy everything looks absolutely normal and like i said you can start to identify certain structures so here we can see the large vessels of the uh, of the of the thorax, which basically emanate from the heart. Here we have the ascending aorta, the superior vena cava, etc., etc. So, uh, if you really want uh, later on, if you want to keep exploring and, and, and playing with later, you can just basically click on that, and then you can read a little bit about, for example, in this case, the aortic sinus. You can read a little bit about the anatomy and the function of this particular uh, um, this particular organ. Okay, so everything's really normal here. But unfortunately, it doesn't last like that. And the, uh, as we know, patients start to deteriorate and start to uh, things start to look uh, a little bit worse. So what's going to happen next? So what I want you to do is we're going to open the other website. We send you the link. This one called Radiology Assistant. And once again, uh, 
this now is going to be a little bit more complicated. So just follow my instructions. Uh, I'm trying to close this. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to close that. Perfect. So what I'm going to try to do in my screen that I really hope you can recreate. So uh, try to ignore the Zoom uh, uh, screen once you once you understand what I want you to do. So put them side by side. On the left, you're going to have the 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 Castle Mountain uh, packs simulator on the left. And on the right, you can put the image that we ask you to open, which is basically, uh, if you open this website, uh, you're going to see an image of uh, an electron microscopy uh, image of the virus. And immediately, the second uh, figure you're going to see is an interactive CT scan of the patient with COVID. Okay. Now, put them side by side, and immediately you're going to see the difference. So let's interact with them. So let's start and be systematic. Start from the beginning, from the apical regions of the lung go all the way up and in the other one go up as much as you can. can unfortunately this one doesn't go up that much so let's just try to put them both pretty much uh, around the same uh, around the same kind of level which will be something like that now compare the difference between the normal in, in the left and the pathological in the right so you can immediately start to identify there's something going on especially in the left long here you can see a lot of opacities you can see a lot of uh, a lot of uh, really weird signals the lung in particular is not that dark immediately you can start to see that there is a lot of uh, ramifications uh, there's the vascularity is actually increased and and the long the lungs no longer black and definitely the most important thing is that you can see all of these areas of opacities this is what we call ground glass opacities now what's a ground glass first of all we need to identify what a ground glass is a ground glass you probably in your house you've probably seen you have a few windows and some of the some of the glass is actually a little bit opaque like this one uh, a ground glass is com commonly used uh, for ornamental reasons, just basically to block uh, uh, the, the, so it they can actually allow the transmission of light, but, but you cannot see the, the definition. So if somebody is trying to look uh, from outside, if, you, if they're trying to see in, inside your house, so a, a ground glass basically uh, will not allow them to look inside. This is another glass that you see very often in in showers or in bathrooms. Uh, so basically, they allow the passage of light, but, but they, they, you cannot see the detail. So that's what a, grouse, a, a, a ground glass uh, is. And in, in respiratory uh, physi pathophysiology, we have coined this term because basically that's what it looks like. A, a ground glass opacity in the lung is that kind of a lesion that happens when air, when this black, uh, beautiful image is replaced by other stuff that is not air, like fluid, like for example, by cancer, by uh, or when the alveoli, like Dr. Seal, you probably remember, she was saying that the alveoli are normally really beautiful sacs, which are all, 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 always very nicely inflated. And the moment they get deflated, they collapse, they can give us this kind of pattern of ground glass opacity. And this is the most important lesion that you can see in a patient with COVID. Now, if you start to explore, you can see it is actually quite widespread. It's bilateral. In other words, it's actually located in both in both sides of the in both lungs. Probably is more intense in the left lung, as you can see. There's uh, there's some of the some opacities are actually quite intense. So that is actually meaning that um, there's a severe uh, consolidation. So the alveoli are are being occupied by fluid. And this fluid that is produced by COVID is full of proteins, is full of cells, is, uh, and therefore is very, very dense. And that, that's why in x-rays it looks like this kind of opacities, which are very heterogeneous, and, and they, they give us this kind of pattern. And as you can see, this is somebody who's really ill because uh, the air is being displaced by the fluid and by signs as well of alveolar collapse, okay? Now, so this is the, uh, as you can see in a patient like this, uh, as, as the disease starts to progress, they can actually get worse and worse, and there's more consolidation, more opacities, and basically this is how you can start to realize why patients become really hypoxic. Uh, when you have a displacement of air and when the alveoli are filled with fluid, that has a significant impact on the gas exchange. The blood gas barrier is 
significantly affected, and a, a, a oxygen cannot diffuse through the fluid, through this protein-rich fluid. So, so that's a really big problem. Okay. Now, obviously, as you can imagine, this is going to create significant problems. Uh, so the patient's going to start to become hypoxic. So, so their levels of oxygen are going to be significantly uh, the, deteriorated. And uh, that's going to have an impact on their cardiovascular system. So now is the time to open uh, the this the other simulator. So first of all, so let me show you this very quickly. So we have a patient, obviously, which is very ill. We need to monitor how uh, how they are progressing. So we need to start cannulating uh, certain aspects of the cardiovascular system. So we insert a cannula through the jugular vein, and then we uh, advance the cannula and we position it right inside the pulmonary artery. Remember, Dr. Seal was telling you that the, we have two circulations in, 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 the, in the cardiovascular system. The systemic circulation, which is represented in red, uh, which, is, which comes from the left ventricle and the aorta, which basically provides oxygenated blood to all the body and all the, all the organs in the body. And we have the deoxygenated blood, which is coming through the venous system through the right ventricle and into the pulmonary artery. So this is carrying deoxygenated blood, which travels to the, to the lungs in order to be oxygenated. So this is one of the most important monitoring devices we need to install in a patient with COVID. When, whenever you see a patient in, with COVID in, in the intensive care unit, you're gonna see they're attached to a number of uh, devices and pumps and cannulas, because basically we are monitoring all the physiological variables we can to basically see how they are progressing and, and act prom promptly in case they start to deteriorate, okay? So you're, you've probably seen movies, these kind of monitors, which give you all kinds of readings. So let's see exactly what kind of readings we can detect, okay? And we're gonna do this in a more, um, in a very, uh, interactive way once again. So we have this other simulator, which this simulator I use in my cardiovascular and respiratory physiology course. Uh, the students really like it because it's a really nice and interactive way to learn physiology. Physiology is something very difficult to, to understand because it's something very dynamic. And when you read a, a, a textbook, everything you see in a textbook is kind of like a snapshot. And in physiology, nothing is a snapshot. In physiology, everything's dynamic things are always changing. And in a patient, for example, you have to see how the variables are always changing. So if you can open the other uh, simulator, which is this one, uh, sbtsim.com. So if you can open that, it should open uh, in both Macs and PCs. And then just, um, in this case, uh, there's not much to see. There's a lot of information here going on. So let me take you through uh, very quickly. So here on the left boxes, you, you can see this, these blue boxes. Um, we're gonna, this is, these are the signals that are being detected. Uh, for example, V1 here, this is the electrocardiogram. Electrocardiogram is when you put electrodes all over the body, and then you can detect electrical activity generated by the cardiomyocytes, by the heart. And then we have other signals here, uh, pressure detected in the left ventricle. We don't need that for now. So if you can untick this one, this is the right ventricle. Uh, we don't need that either. Uh, we also have the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. We don't need that and the central venous pressure. So just to keep it simple, we're just gonna leave these three parameters. The electrocardiogram on top, the aortic uh, uh, pressure, which is this one. This is the pressure, like I said, coming from the aorta, from the systemic circulation. And finally, the pulmonary artery pressure. This is the pressure we detect, as, we, as I showed you, um, by putting a catheter inside the pulmonary artery, which is telling us the pressure in the pulmonary circulation, okay? Now, now that we know exactly where we are, uh, uh, now I can show you, uh, it's kind of difficult to read the signals because they're changing all the time. Now, the important thing to know about pressure uh, uh, variables is, is that you can see there's a peak and a trough because every time the blood is being ejected by the heart, so obviously there's a bolus of blood that travels through the vessel and generates an increase in pressure and then uh, which slowly starts to decrease. And then the cycle begins again and the pressure fluctuates between what we call systolic and diastolic pressure. You can actually read the, 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 the values here 
of aortic pressure here are normally between 120 over 80, 130 over 90. This is the normal uh, blood pressure you can actually detect if you take your own blood pressure. You, you've probably seen your uh, probably your grandmother taking her own blood pressure. So this is basically what it represents, okay? And it's basically represented there. The pulmonary artery uh, pressure, you can see immediately, this is, you can see the scale. This is in millimeters of mercury. You can immediately see the pressure is significantly smaller in the lungs. Why is the pressure smaller in the lungs? Well, because if you think about the cardiovascular system, you need a lot of pressure from the systemic circulation in the left ventricle, in the left heart. You need a really high, uh, uh, a very high pressure system in order to provide blood and oxygen to all the peripheral organs. So for the blood to travel all the way from the heart to the tip of your toes, you need a lot of pressure in order to move all that blood. In the case of the lungs, you don't really need that much pressure because the lungs are just neighbors. They're just located right next to the, to the, to the heart. So you don't really need to produce much pressure. And uh, the most important thing is that uh, uh, not only they don't need pressure, a lot of pressure can actually damage the lungs. So the lungs are very, very delicate. That, that blood brain barrier that we were showing you before, it's a super, super um, a delicate structure. It's only 0.3 microns thick. So a lot of pressure is going to damage that, that structure, okay? So you can actually see the difference in pressure. In the aortic pressure, the systolic is 130, and the pulmonary pressure is only 34. So this is one of the main differences between the systemic and the pulmonary pressure. Now, what happens in a patient with COVID? Well, we can recreate number one here. We have, a, if you see rhythm, you can actually click on that and you have what we call normal sinus rhythm. Normal sinus rhythm is what happens in health. Most of you, all of you have a normal sinus rhythm. It's the rhythm that is generated by the pacemaker of the heart, which is a little structure called the sinoatrial node. Okay, that's what we call it, sinus rhythm. It's normal, it's absolutely healthy. In a patient with COVID, the first thing we're gonna see is something called sinus tachycardia. So the moment you click on that, look what happens. So obviously the, the, the blood pressure starts to decrease. And the reason for that is because the heart rate starts to increase significantly. So you can see the heart rate here. The heart rate before was uh, some, somehow kind of in the, between 80 and 90 in the normal conditions. The moment we have uh, somebody with COVID because, uh, because the, the temperature is really high, temperature drives the increase in sympathetic uh, in nervous activity, which is a part of the brain, which controls the heartbeats. And then it, this increases the speed of the generation of heartbeat. And you can see that the heart rate is significantly increased in this case to approximately 105, 110 beats per minute. So that's one of the first things we see with in a patient with COVID. The second thing we're gonna see uh, uh, there's a lot of parameters we can change here, so don't worry too much about them. Uh, we don't really have time to go through all of them. The, the one I really want to show you is here. I don't know if you can see that, PVR. Okay, we have SVR and we have PVR. PVR stands for pulmonary vascular resistance. So the, the vasculature, either systemic or pulmonary, they, they actually are made of several types of cells. One of the cells are actually smooth muscle cells, muscle cells, very similar to the muscle cells that you have in your legs and in your arms, which allow you to move around, to jump, to walk, to run. Well, the, 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 the vasculature also have their own, uh, their own muscle cells. And when they contract, they create, a, 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 they make the, the blood vessels become very rigid and contract, and they can actually close a little bit and constrict the diameter of the blood vessel. So let's recreate that. If you have the PVR, pulmonary vascular resistance, just increase, move the slider to the right, somehow kind of like halfway through. So, and, and look, at, uh, look at the value. So your normal value is between 20, 20 over 11, 25 over 10, something like that. So the moment you move the slider and increase pulmonary vascular resistance, look what happens. So we're looking obviously, oh, sorry, I think we need to remove that. Yeah. Okay. 
So let's do it again. Let me, let me just compensate and reset. So we have the, uh, so this is the normal patient. This is a normal uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, normal uh, pulmonary pressure. The moment we increase the pulmonary vascular resistance, you're gonna start to see an increase in the pulmonary artery pressure. It went from 20, 25, it starts going up to 35, 37, uh, uh, all the way up to probably 40, if we increase it a little bit longer. And this happens, this is one of the major uh, responses of the lung. So not only the alveolar are being affected, not only the, the, the respiratory component of the lung is being affected, also the, the circulatory part of the lungs is significantly affected. Why? Because there's a, there's a, a reflex mechanism in which these smooth muscle cells I was telling you about in the pulmonary artery, they respond to the lack of oxygen in the alveoli and they basically become activated. And in response, they basically increase a muscle tone and they constrict, they close, the, they basically try to divert the blood flow to areas which are better ventilated. Unfortunately, most of the areas in the lung are not really well ventilated. And this it generates this massive pathology in which we call pulmonary hypertension. The patient's, uh, the circulation in, in the lung becomes significantly affected and therefore uh, uh, the, the, the blood pressure inside the lungs in, increases significantly. And this is very dangerous as well. It's not only the lungs that are being affected, it's also the, the, the vasculature that, that gets severely impaired. And to make it all worse, uh, the, the, uh, the blood starts to clot inside the, the, the pulmonary artery. And then you start to see a lot of clots all over the, the, uh, all over the pulmonary artery, which just comes and basically in, in, impairs blood flow in all over the lungs and makes things even worse. So this is one of the reasons why uh, the mortality is, is very high, not only because it affects diffusion, but it also affects the, the circulation of blood through the pulmonary circulation. It's a very, very dangerous situation. Okay, that's it for, now, for, for me now. I, I don't want to take more time. So we need to finish the session. So uh, uh, Dr. Seal, I'll pass it back to you. So how are we gonna treat Mr. P endemic? As he's not very well. Well, as he is very unwell, he's gonna need ventilatory support. And if you look at the image on front of you, you can see that kind of comes under the step four on the guide on your screen. Now. In addition to this, other medications may be given, although this will vary according to the guidelines of the country in which the individual is being treated. Also, recommendations are currently often changing in light of new evidence, as this is an evolving situation, as there's studies constantly being conducted in this area in order to determine the most effective treatment for all of these patients at different stages of the condition. It's also very important to point out that the treatments you see on the screen are only in relation to those needing hospital admission, whereas the majority of individuals with coronavirus will have a mild disease or may even be asymptomatic, both of which will not require them going to hospital. So on that positive note, let us fast forward two months. I'm pleased to say Mr. Pandemic is successfully treated and now recovering at home. And he's looking much better and strangely thinner and less like a character out of the symptoms. But let's just go with it. So. Our politician, as he's not back at work yet, he decides to fill in his time writing up his experience of coronavirus because he feels that we would all like to hear about it. Hmm, anyway, however, there's a bit of an issue here in that he didn't really pay attention to what he was being told about coronavirus during the whole episode. So he decides that he needs to contact someone because he has a few questions. So who's he gonna contact? who might have some knowledge about coronavirus and all the possible things that could have gone on with his physiology during the event. Well, it appears that he's chosen you. And so with that in mind, let's see how much you can remember by handing over to Dr. Rome with the coronavirus quiz. Everybody getting very excited for this quiz. Let me remind you that the winner of the quiz will receive a 30 pound Amazon voucher, which is pretty exciting. And it's a very quick quiz. Uh, there's only 10 questions. I'm just gonna share my screen. So the first thing we're gonna do is get you all onto Mentimeter. So you need to use your smartphone for this. It's much better. The code is up at the top, 4439393. And just while you're getting onto Menti and you're getting into the quiz, if you could let us know where, you're, where you are today, type in your city and country. I'd just like to make a little word cloud because I think it would be fun 
to find out where you guys are from and see, see what kind of diversity we have in our audience as we're all getting warmed up and logged in. So please do type in your location uh, as soon as you're on to Menti. And we'll start making a word cloud. Ooh, London, 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 Ooh, Dubai. Wow. Turkey, uh, Jakarta. Oh my goodness. What time is it? I don't even want to know. Birmingham, Bonn, Germany, rugby, Singapore, Italy. My goodness, this is amazing. Look at all these places where you all are now. And isn't it amazing that we have the internet? <laughs> especially during a pandemic. I'm so pleased to see so many people here. But I think London is winning. London is winning. Excellent. Okay, uh, I'm going to go on now, move on. Uh, maybe I'll just take a screenshot because this is so cool. Let me just take a screenshot. Yep. Okay. Right. Without any further ado, let's start the quiz. So you all need to log in with a nickname. Oh, look at all the players. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Excellent. I'll just give you a minute or two to all get on. Oh my goodness, look at all these players. I've never done a, a mentee so large before. <laughs> so feel so now feel free to turn on your cameras. If you want to have some banter here, it might be quite nice. Yeah, that's I really like all the symbols. I, I that's beautiful, isn't choose, it? You get to choose your own symbols. I don't think so. I think it's automatically allocated. Uh, well, I, I like the unicorn. I'd like to be the unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it looks like we got some stability here. So let's start the countdown we got 75 participants the 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 quicker you answer the more points you get so which is the largest cavity in the body look at your phones yeah, thoracic spinal cranial abdominal pelvic or vertebral okay time's up Abdominal pelvic is the right answer, and most of you got it. Well done. Okay, next question. Question two. Okay. Don't forget, the quicker you answer, the more points you get. What is the main difference between pulmonary circulation and systemic circulation? Vessels are thicker, arteries carry more oxygenated blood, the vessels are longer and the blood pressure is lower. Giving you a little bit more time for this one because it's a bit tricky. You've got 12 seconds left. Five, four, three, two, one. And the reveal. Oh gosh, there's a bit of a spread here. So 40% of you got the right answer. Blood pressure in pulmonary arteries is lower than in cerebral arteries. Well done for paying attention. Um, that's really good. Okay, next question. Getting excited. Question three. You're all warmed up now. Which one of the following statements is false? Which one is false? All viruses carry accessory enzymes. Some viruses have an envelope. All viruses have a genome. All viruses have a capsid. Some viruses are not ball shaped. This one's a little bit easier. <laughs> Five seconds. And the reveal. Excellent, 45 people got the right answer. All viruses carry accessory enzymes. That's not true. Some viruses don't. Okay, let's look at the leaderboard, see how we're doing. Oh, so we've got Sandra in the lead. Santa Claus Sandra is in the lead, but it's very close. It's very close. It, there's all to play for. Okay, so next question, question four. Okay, what do we got? Which process does oxygen use to cross the blood gas barrier? Which process does oxygen use? Active transport, passive diffusion, facilitated diffusion, receptor mediated endocytosis, or osmosis? Five seconds remaining. And the answer is passive diffusion. Well done. Ooh. 69 people got that one right. Excellent. Okay, next question. Question. Five, we're halfway through guys. 
after this question halfway through. There's all to play for. Okay, which one of the following is not part of the blood gas barrier? Which is not part of the blood gas barrier? Alveolar epithelium, interstitial space, type one pneumocytes, type two pneumocytes, or the mucous membranes, which is not part of the blood gas barrier. Four seconds, time's up. And the answer is mucous membranes. Ooh, 30, 30 people got that right. Well done, that was a tricky question. Okay, next question, question six. In relation to human gas exchange, where is the um, partial pressure of CO2 the highest? Where is it the highest? Alveoli, environmental air, the bronchi, the pulmonary capillaries, or the bronchioles? And I say capillary like an American, my apologies, but <laughs> I am American. Capillaries. Joe, yeah. is that right? Capillaries. Yeah, I like your way. Do your way. It's okay. Capillaries. Three. All, on, all countries here. It's great. <laughs> Time's up. Okay, the answer is the pulmonary capillaries or capillaries. And uh, the majority of people got that right. Well done. Okay, let's have a look at the leaderboard. Is Sandra still in the lead or has she lost the top spot? Let's have a look. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, oh, Precious has pulled ahead. Oh, wait, hang on. Yeah, no, 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 no. Sandra's still in the lead. Frosty's second. Precious is third. Well, that's very Christmassy, isn't it? We've got it Sandra is. the snowman. <laughs> See, they're all Christmassy. <laughs> okay, okay. Six questions down, four to go. And question seven of 10. Go right on schedule, by the way. I'm very impressed with us. The well, coronavirus primarily enters the body through which segment of the respiratory tract? Pharynx, nasal epithelium, respiratory bronchioles, alveolar sacs, or the taste buds. Give you a little bit more time because it's a bit tricky. Which segment of the respiratory tract allows those nasty little guys to get in? Okay, time's up. The answer is, yay, the nasal epithelium. Well done. 67 people got that right. Okay, almost to the to home stretch here. Question eight of 10. Is Sandra gonna keep her lead or is she gonna be challenged? Which symptoms is more likely in the presence of a cold compared with an infection by SARS-CoV-2? So which is more likely in the presence of a cold? Fever, sneezing, shortness of breath or headache? Five seconds. And the answer is Sneezing is the right answer. Well done. Okay, nearly there. Question nine. What role does ACE2 play for SARS-CoV-2? What role does ACE2 play? Cellular receptor allowing entry, helps the virus uncoat, aids in replication, helps the virus assemble or facilitates the escape of the particles. Seven seconds. Which role does ACE2 play? And time's up. Well done, the cellular receptor allowing entry. That's the thing that sticks out and the spike protein binds to it. Okay, well done. Okay, this is it guys, your last chance. Question 10 of 10 for a 30 pound Amazon voucher. Nice. All to play for which one of the following is not associated with acute respiratory distress syndrome, not associated. And there's a, oh my God, I'm not even going to read these out loud. There's so many of them. Have a read. <laughs> 13 very wise. This is a really hard question for the, for the last one. I'm not sure I would pass this exam. No, I'm, I'm not saying that's why. <laughs> Good time's up. Okay, and the right answer is woohoo, reduced coagulation. Uh, most people got that right. This is it, moment of truth. The final leaderboard for the 30 pound Amazon voucher. Who is it going to be? Dun, 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 oh, oh, and the winner is Frosty the Snowman. <laughs> Congratulations, Frosty. Now, Frosty the Snowman. Frosty. 
if Listen. you listen carefully, can you please take a screenshot of your phone right now? You should have confetti all over it and, and the, winning, the winning thing. If you can send that screenshot, email it, please, to the website shown on the screen. That's the same website we've been communicating to you with. So we'll send you your 30 pound Amazon voucher. Congratulations well uh, and, and well done for everybody. Yeah, that was great work. That's it. That's the quiz. I've picked out a few questions already. Um, but the one thing just before I do start um, uh, looking at some of the questions is if we don't get to a question that you've asked or another question comes to you uh, later on tonight or tomorrow, uh, please do email that FMS email address that I've just popped on and I'll add it again a bit later um, because we're really happy to answer any of your questions. Well, Absolutely. Jenny, Joe and Neff are, are happy to answer your questions and we can. Uh, so... Uh, Thing. I'm going to go back a little bit. Sorry, I'd identified the times that people had asked questions. Uh, so sorry, guys. Uh, okay. Uh, so um, one that's come through that says, has there or was there any viruses more contagious than COVID-19? And we've got an option, people asking the chicken pox, influenza, the plague. So what's the answer, Jenny? I think the answer is measles. Yep. You know how the R value of COVID is around one or two. The R value of measles is 16. So one person with measles can infect 16 people. It's so contagious. And this is why the vaccine is so important. And this is why I'm very disappointed that people have stopped taking the measles vaccine because they have silly concerns um, that aren't evidence-based. So please get your measles vaccine and tell your friends. Okay. Good advice. Um, why do some people regain their sense of smell? Do the cells repair the blocked AC2, AC2? ACE2. ACE2. That's one for Joe enough. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, it, do, it, it does recover because it's more that the olfactory epithelium, so the one containing those supporting cells, both the uh, sensory cells and the supporting ones, that will regenerate. So, all of our epithelial, um, olfactory epitheliums regenerate about every four to six weeks. So because we have constant kind of insult to our nose, if you imagine all the horrible smells and toxins that go up there, you know, you just walk down the street and you get a load of stuff going up your nose. Oh, that sounds bad, doesn't it? But anyway, essentially it, it damages all of your neurons there. So it has this ability to regenerate because it's got basal cells, like stem cells that will help regenerate it. Hence why you'll regain usually your sense of smell. Doesn't always. Some people from, um, have, who have anosmia in relation to COVID-19 still cannot smell, most can, but still some can't. However, it can take a long time in some individuals. For example, if you have influenza and have what's called post-viral anosmia, which is a loss of smell secondary to influenza, it can take up to a year or even two years to regain your sense of wow. smell. So because COVID-19 is still quite new, essentially, we don't know in terms of how long that recovery period can be for some individuals. Good question. Yeah. Um, the, ne the next one here is if you have alveoli collapse, can they, can they recover or would they permanently be damaged? That's a Neff question. Let's get Neff to answer that one. Yeah, if you have alveolar collapse, that's, that's a really bad sign. Uh, normally it's caused uh, because uh, the virus also, it, it not only affects the type 1 uh, epithelial cells, which are the ones that facilitate the gas exchange, they also affect another cells called type two pneumocytes, type two alveolar cells. These cells produce a factor, which is some kind of detergent in, in its molecular structure. It's called, uh, we, we discussed it, it's, it's surfactant. The surfactant is, a, is basically, what, its main function is to break surface tension. And uh, these cells are affected as well. So therefore uh, patients are no longer able to produce surfactant. So, this is the, the reason why it, where you, you probably see that uh, patients need to be intubated. Now, we don't really intubate patients immediately when, when they come to the hospital with COVID. There's other, um, the, there's other strategies to keep the alveoli um, uh, from collapsing, to basically to keep the alveolar pattern. Uh, uh, you've probably heard about some uh, therapies called CPAP, which is uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, ta a type of uh, artificial ventilation which basically provides continuous positive air pressure. And by producing this kind of continuous positive pressure, it just basically keeps the alveoli open and prevents the collapse. So once they collapse, what you need to do is just force them to open again by putting more pressure. 
And uh, obviously, if you put more, much more pressure, that can damage the alveolar even more. Remember, the, the alveolar are very fragile, very, very uh, delicate structures. Um, and yeah, like you say, that's a really good question. So they can, they can definitely be permanently uh, affected. But at the moment they collapse, uh, the, the thing we have to do is just basically uh, prevent the collapse or reverse, reverse the collapse by pro, uh, providing pos positive pressure. Great. Um, I'm going to slightly change um, into a bit more information about the course in particular, because I've seen a few questions come through. Um, so are you able to apply for both medicine and applied medical sciences at UCL? I don't know who wants to take that. Yes, you can. I mean, you, yeah, you can apply to whatever you want. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anyone have anything to add to that? No, you can do yeah. both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. And what's the main difference between medical science, uh, between applied medical sciences and biomedical science? Should I answer that question? Because I always get this question. And I'm quite <laughs> good at it now. So, biomedical sciences is focused on the biology, and applied medical sciences is focused on biology and medicine. So, we do a lot more physiology than they do in biomedical sciences, and we do a lot about uh, the science behind diseases. And in order, the reason why we can do this is because we don't focus on every disease in the world like you do in medical school. We focus on the main diseases and the science behind them and how you treat them and how it all works. So it's a bit more of a disease focus, a bit more of a, a healthcare focus. Great. And then, uh, but, but, but they're both excellent courses. And then the difference know. between those courses I said, and medicine has also been highlighted in there. Oh, yeah. So you're not going to get a medical degree at applied medical sciences. Um, if you want to be a doctor, you have to go to medical school. Having said that, many of our graduates go on to do medicine and they, they, they've told us that the AMS program really sets them up nicely to get into medical school as, as a graduate. So that is a popular destination. Great, and are you able to confirm, I think once you've done your first year in applied medical sciences, there is an opportunity to switch to biomedical sciences and vice versa, if that's- <clears throat> Any student at UCL can swap to another course at UCL if they have the entry requirements. So provided you've got, you know, they're very similar entry requirements. I think biomedical sciences requires three A's, not two A's and a B. Uh, you'd have to check the website, but provided you have the entry requirements, transfer is always possible. Okay, great. Uh, we have quite a few questions on that, actually. I'm just going through there. Um, and so we've got a question around internships as well. Um, somebody here's medical university does not have any agreements around medical internships is that is there something that happens uh, applied medical sciences throughout the course medical internships um, i don't think we the students have any patient contact is that correct dr marina because i know uh, the students ask before. Uh, there, i mean in year three for example you do a research project and and some some students can actually have some limited, um, uh, probably not face-to-face -face contact with patients, but definitely uh, access to patient data, so real patient data. And that's basically what most of our students do. Uh, some of them can actually have access to the clinic and they can, they can interact with the clinicians and, and help them collect the data, but not uh, directly face-to-face -face contact with patients would be very limited. Yeah, I've had research projects in my lab where the students go to the clinic and collect samples. Uh, I work in urinary tract infection, so it's we essentially. My students have got lots of we <laughs> from clinics, but not, not actually interacting with the patients. So it's more like very in, clear. indirect probably. Yeah. Yes, very indirect. But yeah. there's so many doctors uh, around. Um, the students are always interacting with clinicians on the course. Uh, and and there, are, there are internships and lots of research projects around. Great. Uh, a question here um, about COVID. So as we've seen the COVID-19 having a new variant, is it possible in the future for viruses to be more deadlier and contagious? Yeah, I'm afraid so. If you, yeah, so a combination of SARS classic, if SARS classic had been as contagious as SARS-CoV-2, so many more people would have died. So yeah, it is. If you've seen the film Contagion, I highly recommend it. It's so realistic. And uh, in the film Contagion, that is the premise. You have a highly deadly, highly contagious virus. And, and the film's very realistic. It's done very well. And maybe you don't want to watch it now during the pandemic because it'll scare the socks off you. But sometime I would recommend watching that film. It's aged very well. And yes, it, we would all be in serious trouble if that happened. And there's no reason it wouldn't happen. Okay. Really. I haven't even seen the film, but now I'm a bit. <laughs> oh, you should see it. It's I awesome. I, I saw it over Christmas. It was great. 
Oh, it's jolly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> everybody dies. Spoiler alert. No, no yeah. not everybody, but most people die. Um, so I've got a question here. So why uh, some of the vaccines need to be stored at extremely cold temperatures, but others do not? I mean, I can, I can, I can just say that RNA uh, is really fragile. And I have RNA in my lab, and we store it at minus 80 degrees. And if you take it out uh, in, at room temperature, it, after about half an hour, it's dead. So yeah. That's why I think it's because it's RNA. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah, I'd agree with that. We've always stored it at really freezing temperatures and then it sticks to your hands when you've got your gloves on trying to take it out. It's so cold. Yeah, but the other vaccines don't necessarily have that problem. They're made out of other things and, and they're more stable. Um, so I'm going to pick up another COVID question and then I've got, um, I'll have a look to see if there's any other course questions because I'm, I'm conscious of time. So we'll only do a few more. So how does COVID cause pulmonary fibrosis? So, well, it, it's predominantly due to the whole damaging of the lung itself through the various um, processes that I talked to talked about. And then you get scarring. And of course, the scarring will mean that you can't actually inflate your lungs very well and it'll progress into pulmonary fibrosis. So it's, it's predominantly a, a as a result of all of that initial damage, because fibrosis that that's caused by various types of lung damage and refers to that kind of you know when you cut your knee you scar don't you so it's kind of that sort of process i'm sure i'm sure dr marina gonzalez could explain it a lot better than i could but unless we can interpret kind of sign language we're not going to do very well <laughs> um okay um i saw a question on here but i seem to have lost it because there's some really good questions and comments on here but um it said so does the applied if you do the applied medical sciences program does that then provide you with one year's worth of medical school medical mission because it was something that you it, I think that was a follow-on from what you were saying earlier I think that's right Neff is that right or wrong thumbs up if it's right it was if um if you were to do the entire applied medical sciences program does that then count for one year of medical school it's at least one I'm sorry I I, I can't remember it's, it's at least one I'm not sure if it's two or not but it's definitely you get a shortcut into to medical school with graduate medicine yeah sorry I don't know the answer to that but it it should be um, easily found. So if you want to email me, I can answer you later. Perfect. Um, and um, a question here around applied medical students. Is there a number of how many international students you take in particular? We have lots of them. Um, I think, I can't remember the stat from last year. Was it about 60% international? Um, it's, it's a lot of people. We, we, take, we have people from all over the world, North America, South America, Asia. Uh, it's really nice. It's a really international cohort. Uh, many languages are spoken. So yeah, I don't think we have a quota or anything. I'm not sure. But there's lots, loads. <laughs> okay. um, so we hit the uh, six o'clock mark. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. I think we've got some really nice comments about how, how much of a great experience this has been for everyone. But to finish off, I just wanted to find out um, from you all, um, what do you think or what sort of characteristics of a student that would be brilliant and would fit really well with applied medical sciences? Well, I usually, we, maybe each of us can answer or Joe and I can answer. Yeah, I, I think it's, we really want students who are, are creative and self-motivated to learn. Like they want to, they want to learn because they want to learn, not because they want a job. You know, obviously getting a job is important, but University is all about knowledge and, and gaining knowledge and being passionate about gaining knowledge. So we look in our personal statements, we look for you know, passion, we look for creativity, we look for you know, sin sincere interest in the course. That's what we're looking for. What, what do you think, Joe? Yeah, I completely agree with that. So enthusiasm, it's always good in everything you do. There's no point doing anything if you don't really want to. So Absolutely. I would say enthusiasm, a sense of motivation, because to be honest, you need to be motivated to do any degree, not just this one, you know, any degree you do. You need to have an interest in it, be motivated in it and be inquisitive because you're here to learn. So always want to explore areas, even things you don't think you might be interested in. And that's the good thing about this program is that there's lots of different modules you can explore and you can find out what suits you. So a lot of students will start off going down one route. Oh, I'm interested in the brain. And then they'll find, oh, actually, no, I quite like the heart. You know, it's, it's like when you go to medicine in medical school, we, you know, one minute you want to know everything about the kidney and the next minute it's like, ah, I don't care about the kidney. I mean, learn about the bones instead. So that kind of inquisitive mind and willing to just really put your all into it, I'd say. Yeah. Brilliant. And we've also heard from Dr. Marina in the chat say you need to be very proactive and hardworking. <laughs> this is true. Good advice. <laughs>
Okay, so I think that's us sort of finished off. Um, Jenny, Jo, uh, do you want to do a sort of a final uh, wrap up for everybody? I just want to say this is a really difficult decision deciding where you want to go to university. And I want to wish everybody luck in this decision. Uh, it's okay if you don't choose us. I just hope you end up in a place where you're happy. And, and really, there's no wrong decision. I think wherever you end up, you, you'll do well. So try not to agonize too much, but good luck with your decision. Yeah, I completely agree with what Jenny said. You know, I've, I've done quite a few degrees, actually, not just the medical one. And each time you've got to think about what you want to get out of a course, what the course offers, explore your options and go with what you feel is best for you. Don't be persuaded by loads of other people telling you their opinion. It's your choice. And if you do what you want to do, you won't go far wrong. All right. So it was lovely to meet you all, though. And thank you for joining. It's fabulous to see so many people yeah. in a virtual sense. Great. Thank you, everybody. And goodbye. Take care. Bye. Stay safe. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.